Yeah, well, I just think I just get started. There's a bit of a confusion whether my slot is 30 minutes or 45 minutes, so we will just see how long it takes, I guess. So I'm I'm Robin Sommer. I'm uh, I'm the guy who's kind of merging all this stuff into master the work which other people are doing. I'm uh, I'm merging that into <laughs> into master and get to um, complain if there are no tests to test this stuff. Um, I'm going to talk about so 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 set is talking about all the great new features and, and the others as well for, for 2.2. I'm going to talk about actually stuff which is not going into 2.2, but into hopefully into future versions. So it's a bit of a longer term um, roadmap, um, projects, and, and, and research talk and outlook. And um, there's a lot of stuff we, we, we kind of keep kicking around, and I picked four areas for this talk. and. Um, that is, like the first two are a bit more like architecture work, engineering work. We are thinking about a new communication framework, um, and we are thinking about giving Bro more active control over the network in a in a in a unified fashion. Um, I'll talk more about uh, what that means. And we have two um, current research projects, NSF funded, um, going on. One is on security monitoring for industrial control systems, leveraging Bro's capabilities to do semantic analysis, and one on um, Exploiting the parallelism we find the network traffic to um, scale this this kind of deep packet inspection across as many CPU cores as you have. Um, the last one is kind of the, the the one which is a bit more advanced at this point, um, and we have a kind of I don't know we have to have some infrastructure in place, and we are we are kind of working on on, on conceptual problems there currently. So. Um, I'll talk about those four um, all at a rather high level because specifics for many of them are not that clear at the moment, so I kind of try to sketch the direction what we are thinking currently, and I'm happy to take suggestions of any kind. Um, let's talk about the communication first. So communication NG. So we have, um, Bro has had the current communication module built in for about 10 years, I think now. Um, and, and currently we have two primitives essentially to send stuff around, in particular in the cluster. So between the nodes, they need to exchange states so that they kind of synchronize their, their stuff. So we can send events from one bro instance to other bro instances, and we can synchronize um, variables at the scripting land. So basically you can pick an arbitrary global at, at, at script land, um, attach the synchronized keyboard, a key, keyboard to it, and we will automatic, automatically send ev every operation which one of the nodes does on, say, a table, it will propagate them automatically to all the other nodes and they will replay it um, locally so that in the end, um, the ideal at least is that they all see the same content for this table all the time, so they synchronize the table. Um, there are a number of limitations with this current model, and one is this, that it just doesn't scale. So, so the one problem is that basically whatever gets sent from one node always goes to all the other nodes. There's no fine granular control in the sense of that you can kind of pick and choose which node needs what. Um, you can also not um, kind of route information across hops, so you need point-to-point -point connections, and in combination these two mean that basically you can't build hierarchies of nodes, which we would like to do as we push um, bro essentially deeper into your network. So let's say we don't want to monitor just the external gateway link, but we want to kind of go into departments, for example, on a campus and, and have independent installation there, which however um, propagate information back up the hierarchy. So that's really hard with the current model. It's also the, the semantics are rather loose for this, in particular for the synchronized keyword, because, um, well, ideally they should always have the same value of this table, sometimes they don't. If they, have if they do like conflicting operations, if they remove an entry um, which another guy is just inserting at the same time, we run into trouble, so it's kind of a best effort service. And it was so by design, so it's not a bug. It was by design, but it's kind of, in practice, not, not really ideal. Um, it's not really integrated with persistence so to keep the data around across restarts. Um, implementation is indeed still a bit uh, fragile. And we have two separate implementations of this protocol, actually. Broccoli is a completely independent implementation of, of Bro's communication protocol, which is also not ideal because we kind of keep, um, basically once we tweak one of the two, we have to kind of adapt the other one, which is not always that easy. Um, so we have a proposal on the table for something new, and that is um, also structured around these, these two kind of primitives, but in different different ways. So one is the for the event propagation, we basically want to keep that, but extend in the sense that you can do routing, 
that you can like specifically address target nodes where you want to send events to, that nodes can maybe subscribe to subgroups of events by topic or by content of these events, and uh, maybe some kind of push and pull mechanism so that that's it's, it's easier to kind of update stuff regularly. The more interesting part is that um, this, this synchronized keyword turns out, if you look at the current bro scripts as they ship with the distribution, it's hardly used anyway. So basically Seth <laughs> has not liked it for a long time already, and, and he's kind of working around everything which, which synchronize in principle could do. Um, he's working around that and, and doing it differently by sending events around, by doing message passing essentially. And, um, and it's due to the, the limitations I mentioned earlier. So basically, I think we were just gonna remove that eventually, um, which will also mean we don't need the proxies anymore. And the idea is, well, uh, one idea is that, that instead what we add is basically a global persistent data structure, probably just a, something simple like a key value store. So essentially all the nodes which are part of a bro setup jointly maintain a global table and insert keys with values. And, and this, this kind of simplified model where you do like <coughs> explicit update operations on that table um, is, is like ar architecturally much easier to, to kind of maintain, to make sure it's, it's consistent. Um, it's easier to, to filter and kind of limit stuff to certain subgroups if you maintain multiple of these tables. Um, so um, we believe this might be kind of a way to trade off a little bit of this magic of the synchronized keyword which we currently have, which kind of tries to do everything behind the scenes, um, um, trade a bit of that for, for better semantics. And, and if we do that, then on the implementation side, you can, I don't know, maybe put a specific node in charge of one table and everybody would kind of send updates to that node and that node would broadcast that out, would broadcast that out again. Um, we would probably have to limit the data stored in this table to whatever currently the logging system also logs. So it's not, you couldn't kind of, the current synchronized keywords supports like arbitrarily pointer data structures and references so that um, removes a bit of flexibility there. But in return, we could use existing libraries for the communication, like like ActiveMQ, um, sorry, <laughs> ZeroMQ, um, and we could also implement this this whole system itself as a library, so that we don't wouldn't need the separate broccoli anymore. So it's kind of a, I know, it's kind of quick going through this, but basically this is one idea um, to, as I said, trade a bit of the magic for something which might in practice work better. And the question is, um, and that's what we are going to explore, I think, for like during the next development cycle, if something like this could kind of support, um, in particular, the more complex applications like the SumSus framework that I was just talking about, where he does a lot of manual like fiddling in the back to get to get all this right. I mean, it's really extremely complex in the background, even though the, the, the user interface is so simple. Um, but maybe you can support that a bit with a better model. So that was already the, the, like the first block. The second block, is, um, and that is something which has also been around for a while, we want to give Bro more control over the network in the sense that um, Bro should be able to tell in a cluster setting the load balancer what it actually wants to see, or in specifically if it doesn't want to see certain stuff anymore. Say you're in a big environment, there are all these data transfers like, like in HPC settings, um, and we heard that example yesterday. So if, um, if Bro has figured out that something is a data transfer, maybe it can just kind of skip the rest of the flow and doesn't need to analyze that anymore. It would be nice if the cluster front end just kind of stopped forwarding those packets, right? And the second aspect here is um, we would also like to give Bro more control over what the network itself does. And the simple case here is here blocking IP addresses, but it could also be um, um, rate limiting certain actors on the network. It could be a kind of rerouting, re-steering traffic, maybe to different VLANs, into some, some uh, carotine ne network, um, into a different virtual circuit, something like that. And people are doing that, of course, in, in various forms. And um, what we would like to do, we would like to unify this approach. So that the scripting layer, you basically get a transparent interface which just says, okay, drop this host, right? Or I don't wanna see this flow anymore something like that, and then basically the bro um, internally kind of figures out what kind of capabilities your hardware has and configures it appropriately. And, and there's, there would be a plugin interface below so that you can, depending on if you have this extensive load balance or maybe a kernel level module which does something in software, all of them would be transparently supported and you would just plug in what you have. Um, so but a particular target here, and that is something which is also like um, from our NSF is funding a lot of this work, so from our NSF's perspective, very interesting, 
is this emerging concept of, of science DMZs, where um, like in, in HPC settings or uh, more and more campuses are actually getting these 100 gig pipes in these days. And um, usually it's only a small number of, of, of nodes in the network which actually do these, these huge file transfers, right? The most of the users like on a campus will never um, send like, like, like petabytes of data around. So it's a, it's a few applications which do that. So if you, like in a standard network, would send all your high volume data transfers which are coming in like, do I have a laser pointer? Yeah. <laughs> which are coming in over here into your internal network over here, then basically the whole path would need to be um, 100 gig clean, so to speak, basically. Basically, your firewall would, be able, would need to kind of handle this load, right? So that, this is why ESNet, the, the backbone of the um, Department of Energy, uh, came up with this concept of science DMZs where you actually kind of split um, right where the traffic enters the site, you split the high volume traffic into a separate path. Right, this is the green one here. And, and you optimize that one for the, for the, for the um, extreme speeds and, and bandwidths there, but you keep kind of the normal infrastructure you have on campus kind of separate from that. <coughs> so, and in this environment, that is something, I mean, these, these, these environments have traditionally been very um, strong on using Bro and, 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 and have been using that for a long time. And at these rates, if you start monitoring these, these file transfers here or at the science DMZ switch, um, then, then it, becomes even more important that you can identify and, and, and just skip the stuff you don't really need to examine because it's not so interesting. So this is where basically from the bro perspective, these are the two interesting like, like uh, vantage points here where we can interface. And um, one of that is, so basically if you look at this, it's, you, this is the border router, the 100 gig are coming in here and, and in a standard cluster setup, you would have 100 gig load balancer now in front, which distributes the packets across a broad cluster on the back. And the interesting part is, so we can now, uh, the goal is to basically give the broad cluster control back to this load balancer in the sense I mentioned, mentioned earlier. So if I'm not interested in this, this file transfer, just skip it. And again, there, there are basically people out there who, who are doing this already in, in kind of various ways, and we would just like to unify that. In addition, the science DMZ switch, which is in this position to actually enforce security policies on IP addresses, on maybe users, maybe on services, um, you can likewise give that guy an API, interface it to Bro, and give it control. Um, for many environments, probably the, 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 the most, the, 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 the most um, appropriate interface to do that is OpenFlow, because these switches these days, more and more of them have this, this standardized interface. So that is kind of a good candidate to target. But again, in, in general, it should be kind of target independent or API independent. Right. So and as a kind of a straw man, how this could look at the scripting layer, and that is basically the user perspective on these capabilities. Um, so we call this kind of in our discussion the packet acquisition and control framework. Split into two parts. Packet acquisition is one, which is this part, okay, getting the packets to grow, right? Which is the kind of the passive perspective, um, controlling what I see from the load balancer. So maybe on the script you have a function called drop for some entity. In the easiest <coughs> case, an IP address. I don't want to see this IP address anymore. Um, maybe you start sampling everything coming from this IP address. So if I want to um, generally not analyze the traffic anymore, but maybe figure out when it kind of stops sending stuff. So I can I just kind of check in from time to time. Um, or maybe my hardware has a notify capability where I can kind of push a certain condition into the network. So I say, tell the load balancer, okay, once this guy has sent uh, 50 gigabytes of data, then I would like to check in again or something like that. So maybe I get a trigger back. So that's the acquisition. Um, the packet control is, is kind of the active version where you control what's actually going on, on, on in the network and what's forwarded. And maybe again, you have a drop, you have a sample, um, maybe a band, bandwidth throttling so that you can kind of rate limit somebody who's kind of exhausting his, his allocation um, or redirection, as I said earlier. And I think what one interesting thing is that this entity over here, as I said, it could be IP addresses, but it could also be a user. So, so if you take, um, for example, Scott's work on, on, an, on integrating all this host level information, or we heard earlier about integrating radius data into Bro. Basically, once we can tie users to activity, um, suddenly we can perhaps do these actions here on a, on a user level basis. So if somebody, if we know a, an account would, was compromised, for example, maybe we just want to drop connectivity to everything <coughs> coming from that account. 
So I think there, there are lots of interesting questions here, basically. Um, what is the granularity? What is the exact set of, of, of uh, math methods we want to support? Um, and then in the end, basically, how do plugins look like which, which kind of implement this under the hood so that you can, um, even if you have maybe a range of capabilities in, in your network, um, and at different points of your network, you are capable to, to, do, to do different things, um, how you get that all kind of mapped transparently to this interface. And there are some ideas, and um, generally, so, so I think at this point, what would be really helpful for, for us would be to get an idea of what kind of actions exactly um, you guys would like to see, and, and what kind of capabilities such a transparent interface ideally would like to have. So if there's any feedback, um, please get that our way. Um, yeah, that was the, the second look. Maybe, maybe I can just stop here and ask for if there are any questions, mother. I mean, I know it's high level and it's kind of uh, a bit far out at this point, but, but it's still kind of, usually, first of all, I should say that, um, usually these kinds of things, to, to get them into an actual bro release, that usually takes us a while. But if we start early, we, we start kind of building up the ideas and we start building up the models, and, and at some point, usually, things shape up and become concrete, and then they, at some point, they show up in a release, and then we are talking about it more concretely at a bro exchange. Any questions, any comments? Otherwise, I will just move on. Um, so as I said, the first two blocks were kind of um, more architecture work, engineering work. Um, something which is more researchy, and by training, I'm, I'm a researcher, and that's where I'm coming from. That's where my interest in all this work is coming from. I want to kind of develop new stuff. Um, we have this new NSF project, which is actually just starting up, and that is for security monitoring. Um, in industrial control systems. And the, the observation is here, that's actually collaboration with NCSA over here and, and also the, the, the university over here. And the observation is that industrial control systems, well, they are obviously very critical to our daily lives. However, they, they do lag in protection. Um, they often run this legacy hardware, which is hard to protect. They um, are rarely built with security <coughs> in mind. Um, in the past, they often had this physical gap where actually um, well, there was no way from, for, for the attacker from the other end of, end of the world to reach these devices, but nowadays they're just connected and, and they can. So unfortunately, the classic intrusion detection system is not really a good fit for this, right? Because um, attacks on these systems are fortunately still quite rare, and pretty much it's, it's pretty much unknown how the next attack will look like. They're usually very tailored to the specific environments. They have to because they have to kind of um, I don't know, if they want to mess with this specific pump there, they, they just need to kind of know what kind of equipment is in use and how this is programmed locally. So it always, will always be kind of a tailored attack if it's going to be, um, um, or I have to, going to be impactful. So, and the other, th that makes it hard to find signatures, right? These, these, these standard um, descriptions of known attacks. On the other hand, um, current uh, behavioral approaches where you kind of just look on the network and see, well, does it maybe not look like it should be looking. Um, they don't really take the semantic context into account of these very specialized networks, which are quite different from, I don't know, the, the, the university's uplink. So we believe that there's actually a significant potential here for, uh, I would say, a bro-style approach, right? <laughs> so um, if we start understanding the protocols in these networks, bro-style, in going into the application layer, getting the, the main key pieces out there, raising these events, and then are working kind of on, on that level, um, then we can first create just visibility, basically means generating logs, just as we do for many, many other protocols. I hear from ICS operators, they just don't have this visibility currently. So they have no idea what's on the network. Um, so I, I think that by itself would be immensely helpful. And that is kind of a first step, which is rather easy to do. Um, and then develop models of at that level, basically, at this event level, of actually the context level, of the protocol level, um, develop models of, of what we should be seeing, and maybe report if something occurs that shouldn't. Um, yeah, exactly. And actually, for, for that, I have a tiny little demo because I, I lied a little bit when I said initially I don't talk about 2.2 things. So we have initial protocol support for Modbus and DMT3 in 2.2. I just wanted to show that real quick. 
So let me see, G2, turn on the mirroring here. Can you guys see that? <coughs> yeah. So basically, I'm, I'm not doing a lot. I'm just going to run some traces through row. So this is actually a trace from our test suite, if anybody wants to kind of reproduce that. So basically, this is current development version for 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 Bro. So the upcoming 2.2, and the basic thing is that we see a new Modbus log here. So basically, it's kind of a little bit short. So basically, we um, Bro starts logging function calls, Modbus function calls. Um, we see exchange between the actors in an in an ICS network, usually between the the like the uh, management infrastructure and the PLCs. Um, so this is this is very basic. We have basically have a lot of lot, lots of events in there. I can maybe show them. Just show you guys. Um, actually, that's wrong. And then, no, sorry. I'm still not familiar with our new structure. Modbus. So th this, these are all the events we are already generating out of Modbus traffic. So basically, it's Modbus has lots of, of, of commands, essentially, and they come by parameters, and, and you get all these events. So that is something which is, which is in there. Um, and and the, the log I just showed is, is kind of just a very basic form of just logging um, the function codes themselves. We have two more scripts which do a little bit more if I add them to um, the command line. Let me protocol it, Modbus. Um, let me just take one, maybe. So I'm adding the, it's probably hard to see, I'm adding the track man map script. And what that does is it actually logs um, register accesses. So that is in, in, in these in the stress in these ICS environments, often these PLCs often have this, this register model where every command every action basically corresponds to um, a read or write access into a register. So if I want to open a pump for something, I write an open value into a register. If I want to read a sensor, I read kind of the current value out of a register. What you see here is a log of all these register accesses along with the corresponding values. So that is what I meant by, by kind of going into the application layer, trying to get the semantics out there in terms of what is actually going on in this network. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's pretty interesting, actually, what one can pick up there. So, so and then and it's, these values essentially, um, these values essentially correspond to physical processes, and that is the interesting piece here, right? So, and that is exactly. I'm, I'm kind of going a bit ahead of my slides. So, so one of our ideas is, in in an an energy environment, um, the there, there's there's pretty good a pretty good understanding of the physical processes. So, if you do a change to that power plant, how that should translate into like 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 uh, real world actions i would i would call it so basically there are these huge mathematical models so you can predict every change how it kind of based on physical uh, on, the, on the law of, of physics how it kind of kind of translates into what's going on at that power plant internally so you can make start to make predictions basically on what you see here in terms of the current state of the network and what commands you observe what should be happening next um, and that is something you can, can kind of start monitoring and profiling, and then maybe devise semantic models for that. True. Yeah. So you only get the updates actually here. So and we have another script which just tracks basically the, the I think the clients and servers, right? Which we masters and slaves in, in ICS speak. Okay, let me go back to my slides. So DMP3 is, is um, pretty much ready as well, so that will be in, in, in 2.2 as well at the same level. Basically, we raise events. We don't do that that much yet on the scripting level, but basically, if anybody's interested in this stuff, I mean, it's kind of a specialized area. 
But we do hear a lot of interest from, from various sites currently in this. This is why I'm kind of bringing this up here. So if somebody's interested in this, the events are there. So you can start writing scripts based on math buffs and DMT3 activity. <coughs> um, okay, that's what I just said. And so, so back to the research project, basically the idea here is that um, we will start this, this is really just starting up, so I'm, I'm, I'm speaking future tense here. Um, so so we, will do, we will start with just a measurement study because um, it, it shows that even in environments where you think they might be more regular, maybe in practice they are not. And actually we have already seen indications that um, not everything is as clean as one would hope, even in these kind of small networks with just a few devices talking maybe just a handful of protocols. Um, so we will just start kind of characterizing actors' workloads, uh, maybe comparing sites, different types of sites. How does a water plant compare to an, a power plant? Um, and as we do that, we will learn actually, I believe, um, what makes sense to log so that we can kind of extend these scripts um, for, for upcoming bro releases and, and to do more out of the box in, in the sense of what, what actually is helpful for, for security monitoring at the logging level. Um, yeah, we are working with a number of, of environments actually to, to get access to, to traffic from these, these um, including water and gas plants. Uh, we have a campus power plant. Um, building automation as a large lab is, is, is kind of interesting too, it's the same space. Um, we are looking for more environments actually, so if, if anybody is kind of um, interested in this and, and, and um, has access to one of these environments, that would be very helpful for us because every environment is different, so the more we can kind of look at, the better we can kind of generalize. So in the second part, I mentioned that is basically we want to, based on, the, on, the, on this understanding of, on, from this measurement, we want to <coughs> go to the semantic level and really try if we can <coughs> tie the physical processes into the monitoring. And, and that is something um, which is really hard, I think, in, 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 in more general environments where you don't have a good idea of just what should be there. I believe in, this, in these are kind of constraint settings, we do have a chance of, of, of really putting effort into figuring out semantics and using that for monitoring and using that for finding stuff which shouldn't be there. So the easiest case is just statistical profiling. I don't know, maybe um, if a certain device keeps sending the same messages and suddenly it sends something different or um, exceeds some certain threshold um, of sending commands to that pump, that might be interesting. But that is basically covered by, by the SumSub framework. More interesting is, I mentioned the power grid state model where we kind of hope we can model actually what the power plant is doing in terms of physics. And the second one is, and that goes back to the registers we just saw in the log file, actually trying to, 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 to model and to predict what kind of registers, you know, what kind of values we would expect to show up in registers over time. And I brought one example um, basically out of a test bed. So if you, these, if you program these PLCs, which do these, these, these interaction with the real world and, and open the pump based on commands, um, you, you, you use an IDE, and these IDEs basically they in there you lay out what kind of registers do you use, and then you assign certain, certain descriptions to them based on the semantics. And you see here uh, there, there are a number of booleans and fixed points for, for levels of a tank in this case, and, and enums. So that means there are different types of registers in there. And I think the first step, and actually that's something we, we started with, is just categorizing based on what we observe on the network, what kind of values we see for registers. Um, try to classify them into, into kind of broad categories. So what are, I don't know, some registers are just constant because that's configuration information, for example, right? Um, some, like these enums, they have just have kind of a finite set of attributes. So we can kind of make predictions based on that because we shouldn't see any, any other values in there. And some are continuous in the sense they are usually the measurement values. So if a sensor reading comes back, it's a floating point or something like that. So and then we can maybe start um, based on these categories to model. For these sensor readings, again, there's a physical process behind that. So it shouldn't jump arbitrarily. Um, if it stays within the operating range, it shouldn't exceed certain thresholds maybe. And maybe we can learn that and then ask the operators to, to validate whether our in inference is, is right. So I, I guess you, you get the kind of flavor of, of this. Um, yeah, and then basically come to these models. So, so as I said, we, we started a little bit of this work and we did a bit of the measurement work and, and it's, it's, I find it amazing how much, uh, as usually in real world network traffic, you find stuff in there which you don't expect. So for example, what we saw is that um, Modbus is a standardized protocol, but it comes <coughs> with tons of vendor extensions. So every vendor does something differently and usually it's not well doc documented. Um, 
And sometimes the vendors also kind of misuse the protocol. So for example, for floating point values, we saw that they are often split up between two registers. And it's not clear necessarily from the outside observer's perspective which two registers um, kind of you need to tie together to get the one to the one floating point value. So if you just look at the network level and, and observe them independently, they don't make sense. As soon as you tie them together, they make sense. That's nothing which you find in the protocol specification. You need basically these, these, these memory maps out of the IDEs to, to find that, and even then it depends on whether the, the description here makes sense or not. Um, or we saw that, that some vendors are kind of what, what looked like cramping as much information into a single register as they could, for intuitively we would have thought no reason because they could have just multiple registers for, for the same value and not do a bit manipulations on that low level. Turns out in this particular case, um, that <laughs> the licensing model for the IDE these people use to program the PLCs charged on a per register basis. <laughs> <laughs> right, so there was a clear incentive for the programmer to get away with as few registers as possible. So this is the kind of real world effects I think you only see when you actually start measuring and then start looking into the traffic, right? Okay, so that's my last block um, and um, that focuses on, actually on a, on, on a theme which we have been working on for a while, and we have made quite a bit of progress, so I'm sure many of you guys have heard us talking about this in one form or the other, and that is that, that we really want to paralyze Bro internally in the sense of using threads to do all this, this, this analysis Bro is doing, rather than doing the, the, this cluster model which we also use now inside the box, just spawning multiple processes. The threading really would give us this, this very tight coupling with, with much better guarantees and, and, and lower latency. And there's a lot of concurrency potential in network traffic, um, just briefly, basically. I mean, there, there are tons of parallel connections which are mostly independent, right? So, so if for the, I would say, I don't know, for maybe 99% of all connections, if we had a sufficient number of threads, we could just totally analyze them independently. However, there are some connections which do relate to each other, and for those, we need to kind of figure out what the dependency is, and if we, distribute workload across different threads, we need to make sure that we take that into account. And this is an example, which is basically the file analysis framework, right? So if you often file transfer, if you have a file transfer, be it FTP, be it HTTP, it's often contained to a single connection, right? So and if you want to get the file out of that connection, um, we can do that for every connection individually in parallel if we wanted to. Yeah. However, sometimes we have these protocols which transfer the same file over multiple connections, like HTTP, um, uh, what's the name for that? 206 partial. 206 partial. <laughs> um, right, and then suddenly you, you have multiple connections here and you have file chunks on both of them and, and you need to combine them. And at that moment, that's, what, that's what, what makes parallelization tricky because now you need to share state between and other threads assuming you do it per connection, <coughs> and you need maybe to log um, access to that, and then basically your performance breaks down. So this is kind of a pretty tough challenge, in particular for Bro. Um, so currently, these, these two layers we already saw earlier, they're currently all in one thread, the event engine, the protocol decoding, the script interpreter. And um, we could parallelize the event engine pretty much directly with what you often call the cluster in a box. It's basically, again, the same approach that as the cluster is using externally, we put a packet dispatcher in front, we split up the connections so that each thread here um, always gets all the packets which belong to a connection. So basically, one connection goes to one thread. And, and per the argument I just made with often the stuff is contained to a single connection, we don't need communication here, roughly speaking. The interesting part is up here, and that is, um, Basically, this question there is, this is a Turing complete scripting language. How do you parallelize that, right? I mean, we would like to do it without changing the language so that you guys can just using, keep using the language as it currently is, but under the hood, everything magically uh, uses all the 64 cores your box might, may, may, might have. Um, so that's tough. Whole languages have been designed to be parallelizable. Um, Pro certainly not. Um, we have a pretty good idea how to do that, and I'm not going into that um, because of time, but the basic idea is that we schedule these events the, which are coming out of the event engine to these threads based on what kind of state they need for being processed. So if I have an event handler which um, 
for example, for an HTTP request event, um, which well, is raised for every HTTP request with the URL, and, and then this code of this handler really does nothing else than, I don't know, looking at the URL, doing some pattern matching. It doesn't really matter where I schedule it to, because it's, it's working on its own. It doesn't need to talk to anybody else. Right? Um, however, if um, maybe I do the, the scan detection, or I, I count how many um, HTTP requests a certain host is sending, suddenly I need to count the cross-connection boundaries. Right? So I have probably a table somewhere, and the table keeps state per host. So then the idea is we would send basically all events um, which are part of this counting process for a specific IP address. You would send that to the same thread. And basically, then the thread could kind of work with per with a thread local <coughs> state, and um, we wouldn't need any communication between the threads. So that's the basic idea. Steer the events based on what state they need so that they end up in the right form. Um, this is really hard to implement in Bro, because Bro is this C++ code from 1995. Lots of static variables and uh, variables and, and, and basically no uh, consideration whatsoever of concurrency. We tried, it didn't work. It, it worked, but nothing which would ever get robust enough for production. So we, we, what we're actually doing is taking a detour. We're introducing a new middle layer into the process, which is um, an abstract machine for network traffic analysis. It's a bit like a Java VM. It's not Java, but it's, <laughs> it's basically a, a, a kind of an assembler-like instruction set with the right primitives for network traffic analysis. So you have um, IP addresses as a data type. You have hash tables with state management built in. We heard from from Reservoir earlier about state management. So stuff like that is just built in into this, this, this abstract machine. So and at that level, we can also design um, a concurrency model. So not going through this, the, 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 this, this Hilti, the high-level intermediary language for traffic inspection, that is the name for this abstract machine, um, offers a number of things, including basically at the concurrency model we can design at that level, and then we can later take the bro script code and compile it in there and get hopefully concurrency that way. Again, this is research, so we'll see if it works, but I'm kind of optimistic. So this is pretty far progressed in the, in the infrastructure sense. So basically we have, a, we have built a tool chain which takes um, analysis specification, that's basically high level analysis you wanna do. Eventually there will be a bro compiler Bro script compiler um, compiles it into this, this 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 intermediary language, the Hilti language, and then compiles it down into native code actually using LLVM, just in time even, and then executes executes it at runtime. <coughs> and um, so on, on, on that level, that is pretty much implemented as a prototype. And we have actually a new research project. This was already part of an of an earlier one, which is now going more into the semantics here and trying to identify these state dependencies I mentioned earlier. So given the number of event handlers, how can we figure out whether they depend on each other so that we can kind of decide how to schedule them? And that is um, a lot of static program analysis um, to drive the scheduling. This is a collaboration um, with the University of Wisconsin in Madison because they have some pretty good expertise in program analysis there. And the second question is actually how to um, leverage specific hardware capabilities your environment might have. Now, say you have a network processor which um, which optimizes certain operations, pattern matching, for example, hash table lookups, right? Um, with this abstract machine, we can kind of integrate such capabilities at that level. So if we have a hash an instruction which does a hash table lookup, we could either do that in software at runtime, if we don't have specific hardware capabilities. If we have a network processor or maybe a hardware lookup module, we can kind of change the runtime library to kind of use that directly. So that is the second thrust of this research project. How do we map this abstract middle layer to different hardware capabilities in ideally transparent and automatic fashion? It's architecture work, which is not really my expertise either. <laughs> but again, the medicine guys have expertise in that. So that's where this collaboration is coming from. Um, hmm? Yeah, I'm kind of, okay. So I wrote my thing and Seth is waiting for that. <laughs> uh, so Hilti enables more stuff. So Hilti is, is this, again, this middle layer, and one part of that is concurrency, but it, it also enables uh, other things to do. And, and, and one is we, um, Vlad talked earlier about bin pack, right? And um, we are working on a new version of bin pack, which um, does not compile anymore into C++. So you, you, you have, just to recap maybe, you have your protocol description, you wanna have a protocol analyzer in the end. So you describe your protocol as a grammar, 
And current Binpack basically takes the grammar, compiles it into C++, you compile and link the C++ into Bro, and there's your analyzer, right? Um, we're working on a new version which kind of skips the compile into C++ part and instead replaces it with compile into Hilti and from there into native code and then into Bro. The advantage is that suddenly we get basically the power of Hilti for the Binpack analyzer. And um, the most immediate benefit is that we get a chance to totally redesign the Binpack language itself and that's what I would like to show because um, we saw earlier, actually it's still pretty much pretty convoluted code actually to write a Binpack analyzer these days as you have seen on the slides. Um, Blunt did the best he could with the current system essentially. <laughs> but if you ever start writing that, it, it, it kind of gets kind of messy. So we are working on improving that. And I wanted to show you that. So this was my mod bus. I switched to here. So basically, um, let me see. Let me, let me start showing you what I, what I want to try to show. I want to create an extremely simple SSL, SSL analyzer, which does nothing else than parsing, maybe if I show this something else first, nothing else than parsing the handshake that SSH connections start with, right? I mean this stuff here. So the handshake initially for every SSH connection starts with this banner. I basically want to write a little SSH analyzer which splits this into its parts and gives me an event which is called SSH banner and give, gets, these, gets the connection, gets the, the, the direction, but most importantly gets the version. That's the first part of the banner and gets the software, like the open SSL, second part of the banner. Right, and then it just prints it. So that's my goal. I want to write an analyzer which raises this event. And we saw earlier how this kind of stuff works with the, with the current bin pack. Um, with the new bin pack, this is the description for the new bin pack. So it's, quite, it's kind of almost trivial, but it's um, basically doing similar stuff as, as in the earlier example. It basically says it starts with the SSH dash magic. There's the version string on the right that are regular expressions, then a dash, and then the software string. And remember what I want for the events is the version and the software. And this is actually all which, we, which I need to define the bin pack plus plus parser. Nothing else, no glue, anything. I need to define one more thing for um, doing the bro interface because bin plus plus in principle is independent of bro, but I want to raise events. So I have one further control file which tells me how this grammar we just saw maps into a bro analyzer. I need a little bit of, of, of code here to tell um, bro which, what the name of that analyzer is. I just name it, name it pack2 SSH. It's running over HTTP. I give it the name of the grammar. You just saw that. I tell it which port is the standard port for that one. And in this case, I want to just skip the normal SSH processing built into Bro. For, the, for this testing purposes, I tell him to just disable the normal analyzer. I just want to use mine. So and this is how I, de how I define the event. So basically, I tell um, the binpack++ compiler, which we're going to use in a little bit, that whenever it has passed this record, right, which we saw earlier, uh, um, then please raise an event and give it the connection, the direction, these are kind of keywords, but most importantly, give it the version and the software that are the two fields out of the record. Maybe I could do one thing real quick so that it's easier to follow. Right, so now you see both. Right, so basically this version is that version over there. The software is that software over there. Okay, so this is all we need to define an analyzer. Can we plot a map we want? No. no. <laughs> because I need to I need to run it, right? So let's let's assume I just wrote this this code. I have a little trace here with a single SSL connection, and I started with my script from earlier. I wait a little bit, and this is the demo effect, so let's see if it works. Um, 
It takes a little bit because now what it does, it starts the WinPack++ compiler, compiles that into Hilti. It compiles Hilto into LLVM. It just in times LLVM <coughs> into native code. It ties that to Bro internally to the event engine. And then it ho hopefully gets ready very soon. <coughs> there you go. And executes the event at first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So basically, you just saw really the, the whole pipeline. So there's no inter other, other step in, in between anymore. Um, this takes quite long, right? So that's, we don't want that. If I rerun this, actually, it should be quicker. Um, still a bit long, but not quite as long anymore, I hope, if my caching works. Maybe it doesn't. So normally, it would have cached the generated code and basically just reload it now. And then it would kind of, within a second, spit it out, which is still, ideally, there should. All right, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in principle, basically, the goal is that you need this compilation process only once. Um, and, and that can be sped up further, too. And then um, every time from then on, it will just use the compiled code as it's, as it's cached and, and executed immediately. Um, so there's lots more, actually, you can do with bin back plus plus. You can add more logic to it. You can add semantic rules to it. Um, you can kind of tie analyzers together, build chains, and, 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 and um, decode HTTP bodies based on MIME type, like within the language. Um, so it, it's much more powerful than the existing one. But most importantly, I think it makes it much easier to, to write analyzers. All right, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. That was my talk. Any questions? Yeah. So, um, Actually, I wanted to talk to you. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about the SCADA ICS stuff that yeah. you were talking about earlier. So a lot of the high profile attack research that we've seen involves manipulating the controllers to do something bad while lying to the human operators. Do you have enough data yet to talk uh, a little bit about how you might detect that lying piece with Bro? Um, I don't have enough data yet to. Well, to uh, but yeah. So, um, we have a grad student that we've been funding for a few years off this first Bro award, and then on this new one, we've extended this collaboration with the T sub G um, group next door. They basically they do uh, power grid security. And so he's used bro monitoring in different points and communicating to essentially tag on uh, integrity checking and authentication and things like that to detect man in the middle attacks by monitoring with bro in two different places and, and have him coordinate and look at things. He's also doing some things where he's running uh, power systems modeling on MATLAB and trying to predict if certain um, actions and different things will will trigger an unstable system and something like a power fault. But yeah, that's it's it's uh look at look for I can't remember the name of the conference right now, but there's a there's a workshop in January at Oak Ridge National Lab and a paper describing something like you're talking about is there. Yeah. And it, and so it, so just, so just to add it also depends I think on basically on the what vantage point you get the monitor, right? So so maybe depending on if you're a different point where um, uh, compared to the management system where you, where you get, get those fake values, maybe you see something by just being somewhere else, and you kind of can provide an orthogonal mechanism to, to your normal surveillance system. Right, Robin, so, so on, on the modeling, right, um, you know, the, the parsing well-defined protocols, right, is, is arguably the easy part, right, sort of understanding what is happening in well-defined protocols. You know, are you going to try and address the question of, you know, should there be a power spike, you know, when, when the temperature rises, or, you know, should there be a power spike when, you know, neighboring power plant, I mean, you know, the should, the should is actually, you know, going to tell you more of what the anomalies are than, than sort of the is. Um, yeah, sure. Jenny. So, um, to, to address that question, um, that's something I've been thinking about a lot because uh, one of the, that's the kind of question that gets asked a lot when we're working on uh, industrial control stuff, like, what's it mean and things like that. Yeah. I, I can't speak for Robin, but my interest in, um, in working on industrial control stuff is really like putting appropriately targeted tools in the hands of people that would know that. 
So you, it's not that we try and detect things that we don't understand, because we can't understand this stuff at every place. We could if we spent a long period of time at one place and talked to people and whatever. But it makes a lot more sense for, you know, if, if a power plant decides that this is something they're going to do and they hire someone, and that person goes out and says, is there a tool that helps me understand what's going on on my network? I'd love to have tools for them where they could, over time, as they learn what various registers on different devices mean, what different devices are, they could have bro scripts that they just make little changes and configurations in, and eventually it gets to the point where they sort of build up this model for themselves. It, it, doing too much magic is always really scary for me, <laughs> so I, I try to really avoid it, but I love making tools for people that are domain experts to do their own thing. Thank you. So Seth has coined these, the, Seth has coined this term human verified baselines, right? Yeah. So, so basically the idea is that, that we use this, this traffic monitoring to, defy, to, to derive a profile which, which kind of reflects what, what we normally see. And then the operator can, gets the chance to actually refine that and, and say what makes sense and what doesn't, doesn't make sense. So basically, we put the, the expertise in there at that level. And then maybe at the end, we get to a whitelist of, of what is fine in this network and what is not. But I, I, I do think, I mean, that's part of the goals, at least uh, of Ravi Iyer's group next door. I mean, they are a research group of half power engineers, half computer scientists, and, and specializing in fault tolerance. And a lot of their goal is, they're using Bro to get ground truth and see what's on the network and see what's actually happening. And then they're using the, the knowledge from power engineering to say, okay, what's the impact of that? Mm -hmm. you know, even if it's not manipulated, even if it was issued by an authorized user. So I, I do think it's not necessarily something that's part of what intelligence that would roll into Bro, but it's part of the, the research project yep. to do that. So. Yeah, I mean, the, generally for this project, I think there, there are these two parts. There's the research side, which just tries to understand what, what's possible, tries ex to explore different directions. Um, and then in the end, I, I'm sure there will, stuff, will be stuff coming out of that feeding into Bro, and it's hard to predict at this point what exactly that will be. Other questions? Otherwise, uh, What about the performance on the uh, new analyzers? The performance on the new analyzers, um, that is where the prototype status comes in. <laughs> um, so my last measurement, which is already a little while ago, um, I, so, so we have a, HTTP, a complete HTTP analyzer, which essentially does exactly what the current HTTP analyzer in Bro does. Um, we have that one written in BinTech++, and I've tried that on um, a pure HTTP trace, for like a worst case. There's nothing else than HTTP. So an execution time with this whole chain of, of like um, Binpack, plus plus, Hilti, LLVM, just in time, native code. This ex res resulting code needed twice as much time as current Bro as it is, which I think is actually pretty good because that's pretty much totally non-optimized, and um, there's lots of potential still on this in this pipeline to optimize the code for various things. Yep. Any other questions? Thanks, Robin. <laughs>